When we have a case study immer, this is a uh, mobile phone application um, pushed by Deutsche Telekom. So if they have a startup here around the corner in the Hubraum space, so in their uh, thing, and we are working with them to get everything live and, and, and uh, running well in the Amazon cloud. And finally, I will um, talk about success challenges and definitely um, the topic is not complete. So there are some, uh, something, some, some uh, parts missing, but we will see. So Kubernetes, who, uh, by the way, who knows Docker? Okay. And who knows Kubernetes? Okay. So great. And CoreOS? <coughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> then it's good that we have not so much input. So, so Kubernetes is more or less an orchestration tool for containers. At the moment, this covers mostly Docker containers, but there are also other container formats like Rocket, which is formed from CoreOS, which has some. Uh, some advantages because it's linear, it is uh, able to check images for signatures very well, and, and it's integrated in a, in a trusted platform module chain that you only can run trusted containers on the platform. So, if it's going to trust, Rocket might be something you should have uh, in a, a proof of concept and then look how this performs against Docker. So, uh, they are quite compatible. There is an open container initiative, and uh, they make more or less the container images compatible among all the container tools. There's even container tools for uh, BSD, for, so um, you are not even uh, bound to Linux if you would prefer BSD for security reasons or something like this. Yeah. And uh, Kubernetes supports nearly everything, nearly every cloud, uh, bare metal environments, and it's also 100% open source. It's written in Go. So please find the seats. There are some seats uh, left over. <coughs> you don't have to sit here. Okay. If, 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 if you want, but there are here's a free seat, and, and uh, so don't. Don't, you don't need to sit on the floor. So this is a big picture. Um, what is uh, Kubernetes? Um, you have a user interface, which can be a command line interface, which is preferred. We have an API, which can be used by curl. And you even have a user, a graphical user interface, web-based. It talks to the master, which is uh, APC. API server, uh, and this is a central core to talk to. Um, it relies heavily on the etcd. The etcd is a distributed key value store, and the main task of uh, etcd is to hold a distributed lock in a way that you are guaranteed that the lock is unique if you need it on an entire cluster. This seems to be to my surprise, it's quite a hard uh, computer science problem, and they try to solve it with a high performance uh, um, code and, and try to make it really robust. So, etcd is one of the most robust key value stores distributed. You normally deploy it in three, five, seven, nine uh, clusters um, to, have, uh, to have a distributed version. So, the API server itself is stateless. And the state is completely in the ETCD. Then you have a scheduler where you can schedule tasks, jobs, and so on, and controllers where you can control things. And uh, on the load side, it talks to Kubelet. Every node has to run a Kubelet. And this means uh, this Kubelet is responsible for talking to the container engine, so Docker or Rocket, and uh, creating real containers. Uh, pulling images, everything which you normally do with your Docker uh, command line. 
So this is a more or less thing which you should have in mind. There is an API, there's a container class, and that's everything um, you know in your daily business. Next thing is CoreOS. We are partnering with CoreOS. We did some development together with them. And they, we helped them a little bit with organizing the CoreOS Fest, which is early on May. We can offer you uh, some, some tickets for a reduced price. So if you are interested in hearing more about this kind of things, 9th and 10th May, in the BCC here in Berlin, it's a core as well this year they come. And quite an interesting number of people is coming from San Francisco. So uh, this is a small uh, part of it. <coughs> they want to do real trusted computing. And this means they try to secure everything. So first thing, uh, if you come from the top, you have to Secure your cluster access. Yeah, exactly. So, so this means only nodes which have the right uh, to enter the cluster are allowed to enter the cluster. There is no site node which can be uh, deployed on the site. And there is container integrity, and here I uh, stress rocket a little bit because uh, this is related to the entire chain of. of uh, of images and containers and, and the hardware. And uh, in a real secure system, you want to run immutable containers on an immutable operating system. <coughs> so uh, CoreOS integrity is guaranteed by being immutable in a way that you normally don't have uh, the need to SSH to the CoreOS node. So uh, I consider nodes which have an SSH, SSH access by an admin not really as secure because the admin can change something and can, uh, can do things like, like uh, changing in configuration, start and stop services. So um, this is <coughs> guaranteed that you can use core S without SSH uh, access if you want. And there's uh, another quite unique feature. If you really need to deploy your hardware in an insecure environment, because, for example, you have a country where you don't trust the government and you have a data center there, you can install your private key on the firmware uh, cross platform module. And CoreOS can check if uh, the operating system, the firmware, the BIOS, and so on has not been changed. So this is, I think, um, at the moment the, the, the most secure you, you can get out of the box. Some data centers in the US are starting to support it, but not um, everybody has at the moment the capability to uh, to use hardware as an integrated trust platform module this way. So, Microsoft, I told you that I think most of the um, examples in the internet are wrong. And this starts with the architecture. So normally um, I don't like the word architecture with computer science because architecture is quite concrete, immovable. You cannot, we, we don't build bridges which stand there for a hundred years. So this is the way everybody names it. And then you have a uh, problem explaining the architectures. Another thing is, uh, normally, even if you are coming into a new project, um, you probably will not start from scratch. There is some existing hardware, software, which has to be integrated. There is, most of the time, some technical debt. And the environments not made for this is wrong. Not made for microservices. So you have to shape the environment and the, the, and, and the software that it fits into the microservices picture and into the containers. 
It starts with the architecture, and this is a typical picture um, of a layered architecture. If you look here, normally you start with the internet on the top, and what's missing here, for example, is this is some content delivery network. You can also integrate it if you want. But normally it starts with kind of load balance, so you can do it with expensive F5 machines, or you can use DHA proxies and services. But you have definitely a load balance layer, which also does a lot of firewalling and maybe HTTP, HTTPS uh, um, transport things. And then um, you have to take this into account, and it's protecting your, uh, your services behind the firewall. And so, yeah, yeah the load balance. Then, normally, you also have a bed layer, where you have some portals and nice pictures, the Ruby fancy application, which does everything to impress the user. And this should be kind of stateless service, because there is no need to integrate uh, state here. If you need something like a cache, for example, I don't consider caches as real estate, and you should include a, a non-persistent cache layer like Redis or like uh, Memcache or something like this, but this is definitely a layer on its own. <coughs> and then, getting closer to the database, here you have uh, your middleware, your business logic, and in this philosophy, um, Business logic also should be completely stateless. There is no state in the business logic because normally you should have a persistence layer, and the persistence layer is stateful. And if you look into the clouds, I would judge a cloud or the value of a cloud um, in the beginning according how many persistent services I get. So. Um, in the Amazon Cloud, you can, My you can get MySQL, you can Postgres, you can get a messaging service, you can get NoSQL DBs and so on. So you have a rich plethora of, 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 uh, of services and this helps you a lot because you're, if you have a uh, clustered MySQL service in your cloud, you don't have the need to implement the database and the database backup and all the things around it. So you don't have to care about the application. And if uh, you want to write the application and not to <coughs> dance around the database cluster, then um, this is uh, speeding up your deployment process or your development a lot. Sometimes uh, there is a reason because you have a whatever. MongoDB or something like this, uh, which is not well supported by your database, uh, but by your cloud provider, then you have to do it on your own. But this is some pain which, in, on the first try, should be avoided. Yeah. But you can ask a question uh, anytime if you want. And then, in this existing heterogeneous environment, everybody uses his or her programming language. So we have normally, if you go into a team with 60 developers, you find Java, Ruby, uh, Python, Node.js, and perhaps one or two other languages. So there is no really something which you can influence from, from a DevOps side, but you have to contain these things to shape them right that they are quite usable or quite deployable. Then, next thing, uh, what we have found is we have various databases from various definitions. So, SQL or NoSQL databases, uh, we found customer which had MySQL and Postgres. Why are you using two SQL databases? Or because the team decided so and they are used um, to deploys this database and everything is around this database. So, okay. Another thing is you have a lot of NoSQL things. Uh, MongoDB, you name it, uh, Redis, which is used as a database, which is not a database really. 
maybe you can't find uh, Cassandra or other things. So, yeah, that's it. And normally in the beginning, uh, everybody mixes local and session. <laughs> so you have uh, you have kind of uh, not really separation. So it's it's all one one clutch of of, of uh, services. Uh, sessions are stored in the database and data is stored in, in session stores so this is something which needs to be cleaned up and last but not least you should consider your uh, messaging queues mqp or whatever you use also as a, a like database because if you put a push a message into a message system it will be stored somewhere there is a database hidden in this message text. If your cloud provider offers you a message uh, service, use it, then you don't have to care about it. But if not, then you have to treat it the same way as a, as a database. And then, yeah, everybody wants to automate, but after a while you find normally semi-automated deployments, so there is kind of automation, but not really uh, complete. It's uh, more or less, yes, we want to do it, but we don't have the time. And through this process, uh, if, if you shape your application containers, then it's time to clean up all these things and make, uh, make clear decisions about uh, removing the technical debt. And make everything explicit and take the implicit know-how, put it into explicit scripts or configurations that you can um, definitely handle it in a, in a way that you can, can make it runnable in an uh, automated environment. And then next thing you find Typically, in, a, in environments, are virtual machines. So, virtual machine assumes a complete operating system. Even if you run only web server, you get a complete operating system with a different kernel than the host operating system. You can get a complete set of libraries involved, and then you get a complete package management. And uh, a complete configuration management. So Stefan will tell you a lot about configuration management in the next talk. So I don't have to rant about it now. <laughs> <laughs> if if he will do it. So how do we migrate <coughs> these uh, things into uh, microservices? This is the next step. So um, in Kubernetes. Uh, the unit for deployment is a pod. A pod is a number of containers which share the same fate, the same life cycle. They are created together, they are running on the same node, they are terminating together, they have one network address, and they can have shared volumes. And if you look into a Docker, what a container really does, container is more or less a bare uh, process on the, on the um, Linux operating system. And it's put into some namespace and has some restrictions on file systems and so So if you put all these together, then the first time is you separate every, every process from the um, hosting operating system. And the next thing is you allow the applications which need to talk to each other to run in the same pod. And this is the smallest unit of deployment in Kubernetes. And you can have pods with uh, one uh, container, or you can have pods with a lot of containers. I think there's a limit, but you can have lots of processes. Yeah. So, and uh, separating these things uh, from the VM cluster 
uh, to, to uh, pods running on Kubernetes, you do this on, in, on, in a, on a big scale. So every virtual machine is split into a pod. This is your microservice now. And then you <coughs> use it in Kubernetes and run it under the control of Kubernetes. And in this process, you uh, separate the kettle, which are the stateless services, into stateless containers and the pads. So you, you should care about your database and your data databases probably are never cattle and should carefully put, if possible, the, the data into your cloud provider uh, databases for uh, simplicity. So, Mr. you mind if I ask a question? You said pods are running on one node? Yes. So if uh, I thought that Kubernetes says a node not pod that you span across that you have an Elasticsearch pod, for instance, yeah, which is a service, and this you can scale out and scale down. Yes, and, and, your, and the scale out means a pod is running on each node. 20,000 pods. You have, okay, but you have, you have 10 nodes, and then they say uh, scale to 10, then it, it will run on, on 10 nodes in parallel. But do you have one pod then that is on 10 nodes, or do you have 10 pods? You have 10 pods. And how is, how is the, the the, the higher level abstraction called? Is it Elasticsearch, whatever um, service? Or if you or huh? um, it's, um, the, the next thing uh, is, is yeah, if you, you, you run pods normally in, in the Kubernetes terminology in replication controllers. Mm -hmm. So the replication controllers allows you to scale the number of instances this pod is running in different nodes. If I have the time at the end, I can give uh, a live example in the Google Cloud. And uh, if you have uh, services, the service is on the load balancer level and uh, connects to all uh, the local replications, uh, uh, the, the local replicas, and, and does a round robin round. So you have this, this uh, layered architecture is reflected in the terminology of Kubernetes that you from uh, let me see. I'm on the 20. If you look <coughs> into this picture, um, yeah. if you look here, uh, the service is running on the load balancer level, so it gives you an IP. And if, if you do it on the right, Cloud, it's only that you say the service has a type load balancer. When you get a service IP, you have to care about nothing. But if you have to do it on your own, if you want to do it on your own hardware, you have to care about the load balancer provider, which does the things for, for this. Or you do it by hand. This is uh, if you only have a handful of what, because load balancer providers, depending on your load balancer, can be quite a lot of work. So, and then um, the, the replication controller replicates uh, this level because this is stateless, this can replicate it infinitely, and also the web portal. And this is uh, the thing uh, which is consisting of several parts. And here, here I, I don't show the nodes, but each web uh, application should run on a different node if it's on the same time. That it is uh, high available and, and scalable. So this is a, the architect, the layered architecture is reflected in the in the Kubernetes uh, terminology and, and things. Can you give examples of it? Does it okay, answer yeah. your question? Okay. Let's turn to continue. And yeah. So, yeah, one word about stateless and stateful services. Uh, stateful services, the databases, either you put it in your own database and you have to care for it. There are databases which do replication easier than others. MongoDB is quite easy, consumes a lot of memory, so it's quite expensive in Amazon. Uh, MySQL my has a different uh, 
replication scheme Postgres has a different, every major database has a different replication uh, setup. This makes it quite hard. If you have a mix of databases, you have to do it for, for, for every database. So if you use a provider database, then this is against the philosophy of Kubernetes. This will create a kind of lock-in that, that you have to use. Amazon has a quite, quite a nice feature that you can have a MySQL database replicated through at least three data centers with, which two, with two copies in each data center. And this is not available in Google Cloud, but Google Cloud, for example, has a big table database, so it depends. This, this creates, if, if you decide to use this database away from the cloud provider, uh, once you have to use it, then this will create a login. And the overall mindset we should have uh, as a vision is that all these deployment units should be ephemeral. So you can kill one thing and it will be replaced somewhere else and this works. There are some databases which uh, need IP addresses for replication. And these don't work so well in this environment because if, you, if a node dies and a new node is created, your service will get a new IP address. So uh, this is kind of pain in the moment. Business logic, yeah, on the front end, it's definitely quite easy. Everything is uh, stateless. You can replace it anyway. You can start, stop. Ports, the node dies, it will automatically be replaced by Kubernetes. And you can integrate it into uh, your deployment pipeline. Whatever deployment scheme you want, if you want a, a blue green deployment, you can have namespaces for your containers, your nodes. You can have um, test nodes or nodes which do different things on, on different uh, times of the day. You can uh, do a lot of, of nice features uh, with, with the running uh, cluster. So, makes a lot of uh, things easier. Then uh, you should think about parameterization applications. This means uh, you have typically uh, several ways to store your configuration. You can put it in ETCD, which is not a good idea, but it would work. Uh, because etcd is a key value store, you can put it into your container's environment variable, which is quite easy, unless you put your secret passwords into the environment variables. But your secrets, uh, there is a special way of putting secrets into containers. Your secrets can be uh, put into a secret store. So the secret store never will hit the hard disk um, of the operating system, so no traces left. You have it in memories, and the, the memory is mapped to the file system inside the container. So you can read out um, the secret store as a file from inside the container. <coughs> you can use a built-in login, which is quite okay, but if you have a high traffic application, definitely you want to own uh, syswap to get the, the edge stack or the Splunk up and running. And there is, uh, of course, at the moment, a discussion how to monitor this thing. So there's Prometheus from SoundCloud, which is quite popular. There are popping up a lot of other tools. So there is something. And you, obviously, you can use your Zabbix or Nagios or Singer, or whatever you want, in a separate container. OK, what should you avoid? Privileged special applications, no application servers, please. So the good old Java application server is dead. If you ever wanted to kill him, now it's time. Uh, EGBs and things like this should not be run in a, in a container. The same with the LAMP stack. Um, LAMP stack requires everything to be run in, on the same system. Uh, this is not a good idea with containers. Um, yeah. Separated concerns. This is more or less the architecture. The architecture again. This is what uh, the desired architecture should look like. 
And by implementing everything into this thing, you, you have to clean up your technical depth anyway. And, and then you are ready to work. And if you uh, have your application in this shape, then you can definitely uh, deploy it in a Kubernetes code. Case study, this is our customer. We are going to talk about this. This is immer they make quite a buzz on the Mobile World Conference. Effectively, it's a service from Deutsche Telekom, so they go into the cloud with their new telephony service that connect telephony and, and uh, video phone in the cloud. And they are not using the telephone, uh, the telecom data centers anymore in this project. We will come in 2016, an open communication service, voice messaging and Berlin, and the first start will be in, in Slovakia. Okay, what was easy, uh, if you look into the frameworks, Java with Spring Boot is the easiest thing because in Java you have this uh, mess of libraries buried under in war, here, Java files and property files and it's quite easy to overwrite the configuration from the command line with Spring Boot. So Java with Spring Boot uh, was quite simple. Python, uh, surprisingly, was also quite simple because of the virtual environment gives you a way of creating your containers quite easily. Ruby was quite harder because building gems uh, must be done during creation of the containers. And so, uh, what you really do not want is to deploy a compiler within your container. So there is a is a solution uh, we are just uh, looking into at the moment, traveling Ruby, which creates one static binary from all your Ruby gems and then runs it as one static file. The Ruby version handle with, with RVM is not really getting better. So uh, yeah, so this was experience. What's missing? Um, security audit. This is uh, something you have to take into account. Stateless and persistent services is helping you. And uh, what I definitely recommend is to uh, look into every Docker file, every image you run from, uh, from the internet is a post potential security risk. And you should run it in your own Docker file in the private registry or be very careful about what, what's going on. You can run private registries and you can even use one uh, registry from CoreOS, this KIO. And what's quite unique in the KIO registry is that they have the lifecycle monitoring, and say if you push a container there, uh, every component of the container is compared with a, uh, with a security incidence on the CVE database. So if you have an insecure version of a Ruby gem inside it and it has a CVE letter, a CVE number, then you will be alarmed. So, yeah. As I mentioned, most of the things are quite straightforward. Uh, in the end of the process, you have a service architecture as, it, as you ever wanted it. And you will, deployments are getting smaller, easier than, than uh, virtual machines. This is what you have to tell your business managers why you want it. Typical faster deployments, faster time to market, etc., etc. Results, yeah. To summarize it, minimal parameterization is something you should uh, aim for. That you get really easy deployable containers. Configuration management today for me is decided, but uh, Ruby, Chef, and other. Um, guys definitely are discussing it. In the beginning they wanted to run, do a chef or puppet run inside a container in, the, in production, which is, in my opinion, one of the worst ideas you can have in the container business. Okay, success. 
um, we can manage more or less everything. We have Rina containers. It's immutable. And if we would go deeper into the business that we really try to get the operating system out of the container, only static um, container, st static applications in a container from scratch, then you can have a Postgres binary statically linked with 29 megabytes. A Go web server is 6 megabyte in a container statically linked. It's easier with Go if you choose a new programming language in a new project statically linked Go is something which helps you go faster into this way than every other language at the moment. Okay, let's like uh, I mention this. Best practice. Yeah, normally in, in, a, in a project you have so this last thing which is handcrafted and uh, yeah, uh, you have to try to remove it or live with it. And one side effect uh, I would uh, mention here. Um, even if you roll out a stateless uh, container, it can have an impact on the database if the database scheme is changed. So, plan it that the database uh, scheme is changed. Plan it in a way that you can go forward. Plan it that you have the real amount of data in your test environment that you don't have to go back because most of the time there is no roll back for a database. It's quite a hell, it's very complicated. There are some solutions being developed for this. For example, you can have an elastic search cluster with a thousand nodes running in containers from Create.io, things like this. Um, but uh, this will be different for every database. So the baggage you carry, yeah, I already mentioned this. And yeah, container. So, if, as I mentioned, if you have to change, if you have to choose a new language, go is on your side. <coughs> is it scaling? Yes, we will scale it by country. Um, we are not quite sure if we do a single tenant or multi tenant use case. And if you look into the cloud, it, containers normally don't run on bare metal at this time, they run on on a virtual machine, and this is the rest of the isolation you need. If you want to run a private Kubernetes data center, you have to, you can do it, but you have to care for a storage provider, a network provider, and as I already mentioned, a firewall provider. Um, Matthias has created the core is a, a, a Kubernetes cluster on a Raspberry Pi, so this can be as small as this, but um, this is quite special and not really useful with the old raspberries. I think we will have the new ones will soon then quite good. Okay, if you want to hear more from us, we have a website, we have a blog. And if you want to have a training on Kubernetes and container related things, uh, we offer trainings on our site. And if you just want to look into our contributions to open source, visit us on GitHub. And basically that's it. And this is the way your cloud should like you should be on top of the clouds, not uh, below the clouds. I have a <laughs> picture here. This is an Asparagus <laughs> cloud. Nobody knows how it's created. This was an astronomy <laughs> picture of the day two two days ago. And this is not as ready as this. So, if you have questions, please ask now. So, when you, when you mentioned like not parameterizing the containers, like what, what's the alternative? Or what, what's the alternative that you uh, suggest? Is it like convention or configuration? Is yes. Hard like coding values? Is it having the database always reachable while the same yet? Mm -hmm. Or what's um, the Matthias wants to answer. So the, one problem we uh, faced was that a lot of uh, configuration support more or less hard-coded application, or 
for the developers and both um, Kyle still have with uh, exceptions for each environment they deploy their application there. Um, that leads to stuff like uh, we deploy uh, the application to the container in our own environment and it starts to connect the services we never saw before and we obviously not, not have there. So um, we ask them to gather the Overwrite there and that, either remove the embedded stuff completely or uh, read from the command line and overwrite the internal stuff or say as an explicit place where we can place uh, a file. So there is a missed one configuration way in Kubernetes is config maps. So basically we use the one we use. So uh, that works in a way uh, you define a config map and uh, the config map appears magically uh, as a volume inside the container. So it's quite a nice way to configure the applications inside. So use as much configuration uh, defaults in the application you can, so that you don't have to configure every thousand stuff. Yeah. And yeah, that's basically that's what I use convention, a lot of convention is good and yeah. don't have to And I turn my secret to get back to this. And that secret <coughs> is very much this. This config map stuff and never touches this. Secrets in a different level, you can, for example, have secrets for, um, for your registry. If you run a private registry, you can define a secret um, that while the pod is starting and starts to pull your images down, uh, it needs a secret. So it can read the secrets in the listener for it. So if you Actually, I don't know if we use secrets somewhere inside the content. But if we uh, hold our four or one maps in the project here. Okay. okay. General rule is normally you run only one process in a container, and this one process needs typically a handful, not more, configuration. And this can be if they are security uncritical in a in, in, in an environment variable, you can simply pass this this uh, Kubernetes. Or you have a um, secret database password and then you put it into a secret and put it somewhere else. So there should not be this enormous number of configurations parameters you sometimes say. And this is um, not really necessary. If everything goes wrong, you can. Yeah. No, I don't think so. That, that, that we have not seen it so far. More questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, as you mentioned, Huawei I.O. Um, looks into your images and looks for um, like CVEs, like security violations that in your image. And um, I tried, tried out, for example, the official Erlang image from Docker, like from Hot Docker, and it already found like 100 um, problematic um, things in there because it's still on Ubuntu and maybe not all stuff is fixed. So, um, so my question is when you're running that in production, are you building your base images on your own, or are you um, depending on other entities? I would try KIO, and I don't know if how good they are with with Erlang related stuff, but definitely um, container lifecycle management is a problem. If you if you do it in the Google way, they create two billion containers every day. So the container lifecycle is not longer than one or a few days. It's not. Like, oh, my Linux system runs for three years now. This is completely uh, wrong from a security perspective. But if, if, if you have something like this, um, then you should, you, you should you roll out your latest version more or less at least weekly. Yeah, that, that the latest version is the problem. So if you take the latest version of the Airlines container from Docker Hub, you already get 100 security violations included. And the latest version. Yeah, but it's, it's, it seems to be quite old, right? Because all the official images are rolled to Alpine Linux nowadays, and or uh, nowadays, like three months yeah, ago, four yeah, months yeah, ago. Yeah, and if it's still Ubuntu, then it's then a little bit unmaintained. Yeah. Therefore, we create our own Docker files on our own registry, and I think that's the, that's the only way around. I think that the stuff on Docker Hub is for for me, it's. Completely unclear what's in, and um, you, you, uh, normally you get the Docker files and you can build it on your own and put it into your own registry. Running your own registry without KIO is you need a half a day or something like this to set it up. But uh, if you 
pull uh, thousand images from your own uh, registry in, in parallel, it looks like it DDoS attack against this. So you should be aware that this can have quite a heavy load. But KIO is prepared for this, I think. And <coughs> I, I would give it a try. It's not so expensive. And if it does not detect the security um, bugs in the thing, then I would talk to the guys and say, why do you not cover our language? Wait, sorry, it's your baseline for the Docker file. You have to start in some way. You use something like an flame quiz box or a naked of I, I, I think in any major registry you can simply drop a Docker file and it builds it uh, inside the registry. You don't have to, to care about this. But, but um, I would just recommend that one. Sorry, we are running out of time. Uh, we have a lightning talk coming up by Antoine. So I'm uh, around here. So yes, there's going to be time in the break. Uh, we can discuss more topics, but uh, yeah, we're sort of running out of time. Thank you, Thomas.